here to help you with breeze planting seeds and teaching skills teachers turn schoolyards to trees Hello and welcome to School Gardens with Ease podcast. I'm your host, Leila Mireskanderi, and this is episode number 20. In the last episode, which was all about the biggest mistake teachers make with school gardens, we concluded that you need gardening lesson plans, but I warned you not to jump into doing that before you hear about the biggest mistake teachers make when writing gardening lesson plans. And I promised that I'll tell you about it in this episode. So let's get started. I want you to think about it for a second. If you have ever written a gardening lesson plan or even looked for a gardening lesson plan online, how did you approach it? Did you think to yourself, what's my core curriculum that I could be teaching in the garden and then wrote or found a lesson plan for that? That's actually the wrong way to approach growing a classroom or a school garden. For example, one type of lesson plan that I see available a lot on the internet is lesson plans about soil soil texture, soil structure, etc. And those could be considered gardening lesson plans because, of course, the subject of soil relates to growing food a lot. But most of the time, these lesson plans don't have a growing component in them. And even if they do, they're not going to grow you a school garden, even a classroom garden. Or let's say in math curriculum, you need to teach about data collection and measurements. And so you decide to teach that with gardening. So you grow a few bean plants because beans grow very fast and you can observe and measure their growth with your students and gather the data and do all the good stuff with it. You probably grow those the wrong time of year simply because your goal wasn't to teach about growing food. It was to teach that math concept. So after you are done with those poor bean plants, what do you do with them? You either throw them out in the garbage or you give it to your students to take home to their inevitable demise. Yes, maybe your kids learned about data management in a very hands-on way and hats off to you for that, but that not only didn't help you or them to grow a garden or even one type of food, but it even had a sad ending as the kids took them home and watched them die (laughs) or, you know, came to school one day and it, it was all thrown in the garbage. I mean, no thank you. Let me give you another example. Let's say you decide to expand your students' vocabulary by introducing them to different herbs, vegetables, and fruit, a language lesson. And instead of picking up a book or giving them boring worksheets, you decided to make this lesson hands-on and grow herbs, fruits, and vegetables with your class. So you write a language lesson plan and as the experiential part of that lesson plan, you plant vegetables, herbs, and fruits with your students. If you do that only with one or two seeds, your language lesson is not going to be very informative. And if you do grow tons of different, you know, varieties of seeds and fruits and vegetables and herbs and all of that, then that would be a lot of work for a language lesson or even a unit. So your lesson plan will either be inefficient or way too much work. Now, think about those times that you wrote or looked for a gardening lesson plan. Did you start with a subject that you were required to teach in your math, science, language, arts, social studies, etc., and try to write or find a gardening lesson plan for that covers that? That's the biggest and unfortunately the most common mistake that I see teachers make when they want to, you know, grow a garden in the classroom. So, the difference between gardening and growing food and other types of hands-on activity is that those could be, you know, a one-off thing. But gardening is not a one-off activity. It's not like cooking or baking, you know, because cooking or baking could be a one-off thing. If you want to teach fractions in math, following a recipe and baking a pie, for example, that works totally fine. Not only your students will learn about fractions in a very hands-on way, but they even learn how to cook a pie. 
But growing one seed, you know, in one session is not going to grow you a garden or teach your students how to grow a garden or grow food. Growing a garden is a series of tasks that take time and patience, takes observations over time, and a long-term commitment. Now, you might be thinking, Leila, weren't you the one who told me to grow the garden during my class time? Didn't you tell me to do that? I need to have, you know, lesson plans that connect to my core curriculum so that I can do it during class time? Yes, absolutely. But I need to bring your attention to the very main word or key phrase in all of that, growing the garden. You want to grow a garden, no? Otherwise, there are plenty other hands-on activities that you could use to teach your core curriculum. The cooking activity I just told you being a very, very good example. Just last week in my daughter's school, the science teacher made ice cream with the kids to teach science. That was a one-off activity. The kids had lots of fun. They learned a lot. And because they did that science lesson through an experiential learning activity. You're not listening to this podcast just because you are looking for hands-on activities to teach your curriculum in. If that's all you're looking for, you're on the wrong podcast. There's plenty other activities you can do instead. You're listening to this podcast because you want to grow a garden. And so it happens that growing a garden connects to a million and one core curriculum subjects. And that is super helpful because it gives you the chance to grow during your class time. Tell me this, which one of those example scenarios I just gave you or the ones that you could think of that you have done before grew you a garden? Neither, right? So putting your core curriculum learning expectations in front of you and writing and finding one-off non-cohesive gardening lesson plans to cover those subjects will not grow you a garden, not a classroom garden, not a school garden, no type of garden. It just won't. Why? Because growing a garden needs doing certain things at certain times, regularly, orderly, and consistently. You need to have a list of seeds that you want to grow. You need to make sure those seeds are proper for for a school environment. Uh, You need a growing schedule for those seeds. You need to start seeds according to that growing schedule. You need to repeat that activity of starting seeds for weeks with different seeds according to that schedule. Also, hardening off and transplanting those seeds seedlings that you grow according to that schedule, watering, pruning, etc. That's how a garden is grown. The trick is to do all of that with proper timing, which is not rocket science, by the way, during class time. Now, so you don't want to write a bunch of scattered non-cohesive lesson plans that covers your core curriculum, but doesn't grow your garden. That won't grow your garden. And that's why this is the biggest mistake I see teachers make. So how do you do it instead? I'll tell you how. And this is how we wrote lesson plans for all of our OASIS series of programs. Those programs are collections of lesson plan packages that will grow you an amazing garden during your class time using around 10 hours of instruction time in spring for 10 weeks, let's say. An hour per week for 7 to 12 weeks, depending on which one of those programs in the program series you choose. So what I'm about to tell you here or teach you here is one of my biggest secrets. So listen in carefully. Instead of starting with what you need to teach in your core curriculum, you start with all the things that you need to do to grow the garden you want to grow. Now, this could be a classroom garden. It could be an outdoor container garden. It could be an outdoor raised bed garden. It could be an in the ground garden, any type of garden that you want to grow. Doesn't matter. Every one of those types of gardens needs a bunch of things to be done. For example, you need to grow seedlings indoors. You need to build a garden if you don't have one and you want this to be an outdoor garden. You need to harden off those seedlings. You need to transplant them. You need to water them regularly, etc. To keep it very short and simple. Every one of these activities needs a step-by-step guide that you need to write first. For example, building a hugo culture garden on the grass area needs a step-by-step activity guide so that your students can follow and do it. You could look it up, you know, on the internet, there's plenty of guides, but make sure that you revise it so that it is 
proper for doing it with students. Things are different when adults do them. When when kids are doing them, there are, you know, safety considerations that you have to have. You know, you have to make things simple. You have to group them and organize them in a certain way so that they can do it together. And trust that you would know because you are a teacher. Maybe you haven't done this activity particularly with your students, but you've done group activities with your students before. So when you're looking at those adult guides and, and, you know, they tell you step one, do this, you're going to go, nope, for my students to be able to do this step one, I have to organize them in this way and situate them in that way and group them in whatever, you know, so you know how to do that. Make sure that you write those step-by-step growing guide activities in a way that's proper for your students. Or simply go and grab grab my guide. I have plenty of guides on my website with, you know, very reasonable prices. After you write your series of growing guides step by step, then you need to connect those guides to your curriculum. And you have to, you know, put those guides and say, okay, so this is the timing that I have to do to grow this garden. Place those guides in those timeline and that timeline and, and then connect those to your curriculum. And the fantastic thing about gardening activities is that each one of those activities connects to a gazillion math, science, language, etc. subjects. For example, when your students grow seedlings, you can teach about seeds. You can also teach about soil because sunlight is also important in doing that. Water is also important. Seeds are important. You can also, you know, do counting lessons, measurements lessons, fractions, social studies, even very complicated social justice and environmental issues. They all connect. You can go as deep as you want or as shallow as you want in a million and one different directions. Whatever you want to do, you can connect it. And that's awesome because to grow a garden, you don't just start one type of seed in one session. You will need to repeat that activity for weeks, at least once a week. And every time you can teach another one of those core curriculum subjects with that same activity with a different seed. One time you teach about seeds. Another time you teach about water. Another time about sunlight, etc. And then write your lesson plans that way. I hope that makes sense. So you don't start with your core curriculum subjects. You start with all the tasks that growing a garden, the garden you want to grow, needs. Lay them out and time them according to nature's schedule and your school schedule so you know what's going to be done when. Now, to do those things in class, you need to connect them to your core curriculum. And no matter what you teach and which grade you teach, especially if you teach elementary and middle school, Every one of those activities connects to a million and one subjects. And write your lesson plans that way. I never forget a million years ago when I just started doing this work, I was doing it as an after-school program. Then one day I brought my program, which, you know, was all about growing a garden at school. I wouldn't even call that a school school garden at this point and presented it to the principal. The idea was to pitch it as an after-school program. She looked at me and my presentation and my pitch for a while as I, you know, flipped through them. Then she stopped me and said, oh my God, Leila, why is this an after-school program? I want you to run it during class time alongside my teachers because this connects to everything. And that was the start of my real work, the work that finally started to have a lot of impact. And God knows how much I've learned alongside teachers over the past decade doing this work and seeing all the connections that could be made, which of course have informed the lesson plans that I have written and fine-tuned many times over over the years. Hence the amazing Oasis series of programs. If you are curious about them, the link is in the show notes. But if you take one thing out of this episode, I'd like it to be this. Writing gardening lesson plans starts with the idea of growing a garden and then connecting that to everything in your curriculum, not the other way around. Let me know if you have any questions and I will do my best to answer them in future episodes. Talk to you next week in another episode. You've listened to the entire episode and for that, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts 
and Spotify. And please share this episode with other teachers who might be interested in this topic. See you next week for a new episode.